Welcome, everybody. My name is Kathy Greenler Sexton from Subscription Insider, and this is the enterprise journey to advanced monetization, what you need to know. Today, I have two experts here in subscription monetization and strategy. Stephen Harrell the, is the VP and Research Director of Ventana Research. He has over three decades of experience and he leads the expertise in the Office of Sales and guides leaders in the applications and technology for buying and selling products and services to maximize revenue. We also have Dennis Wall. He is Billing Platform's CEO and Dennis brings more than 20 years of experience enabling companies from mid-market to the global 100 to help realize transformational change through innovative software and services solutions. So you know Ventana and Billing, a little bit of background about both of them. Ventana Research, they provide comprehensive analysis and research coverage in the industry for business and IT professionals worldwide, are members of their community, and they benefit from Ventana's research insights, as do highly regarded media and association partners from around the globe. Their views and analyses are distributed daily through blogs and social media channels, including Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And those of you who are not familiar with Billing Platform, they help companies take a modern approach to revenue management. Their cloud-based platform enables companies to easily automate their quote-to-cash processes and give them the power to create and deliver any billing model and support even the most complex recurring revenue relationships. Their customers include many leading global enterprises, and they are recognized as industry leaders for the strength of their product. So we have two powerhouse experts with us today, and we're gonna get right into the monetization strategies. Now, today's webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, is one of the many programs that Subscription Insider offers every day and we have a few coming up that I wanted just to make you aware of. Next Tuesday, we have an executive roundtable focused on payment profitability. A week from today, we have a webinar focusing on subscription pricing. And then we have two weeks from today, everything you wanted to know about Dunning. I'm really excited to highlight our upcoming conference, Subscription Show 2021. That is going to be November 1st through 3rd in New York. Billing Platform is our co-host and together, we're going to explore what is transforming our businesses and provide all of our attendees with solutions, strategies, and tactics to really thrive despite whatever is impacting our markets and our customers. So with that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Stephen to get started with our program today. Stephen? Thanks very much, Kathy. Um, I'm delighted to be here sharing the stage with uh, Dennis and um, I'm hopeful that the audience will walk away uh, knowing a little, more, a little more about the subject than they came into it and perhaps some pointers as to ensure that uh, if they're thinking about um, looking at a billing platform and monetization platform, they're going to start making some more informed decisions. Uh, before we get into the panel discussion with Dennis, I'd just like to share um, some, some, some research thoughts um, from Ventana Research. As, as Kathy mentioned, I'm in the Office of Sales, and part of my remit is to look at the whole of the subscription, monetization, and billing uh, uh, vendor landscape, and also from a buyer point of view, what should people be thinking about in terms of what's important to them. And uh, we have here a market assertion. So a market assertion is our view based around a timeline of an interesting factoid about what's happening in the marketplace. And here I'm saying that through 2023, fewer than one half of organizations will have a dedicated technology that effectively and profitability supports subscription management processes and the subscriber lifestyles. And that might be actually somebody like yourself um, as a member of the audience today, where uh, perhaps you have a homegrown system or a, a ad hoc spreadsheet based system, and you're thinking about, well, maybe there's a better way of doing it. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So if we can move to the next slide, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the trends that we've been observing in the market. And 
I think one of the key key ones is that a subscription management a subscription um, business model is not new. It's been around for a number of years now. But I think what is new is that more and more organizations are looking to see how they can incorporate this as part of their general business model. And there are a variety of different reasons for this. Uh, one of them is competitive advantage. Um, as customers, uh, both personal and B2B in their personal lives, have become much more familiar with the concept of a subscription and the idea of a more uh, understood, steady uh, cost stream spread over time. Uh, that same idea is now um, filtering into the business world and people's expectations of how they do business are very much colored by their experience of a Netflix or an HBO. And from, a, 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 uh, from, a, from an organization point of view, um, people are seeing that this is a way of deriving competitive advantage by actually fitting in with what customers are expecting in terms of how they do business. Uh, because you know, customers prefer the predictability of knowing what they're going to be spending each month. Um, in the B2B world, unlike, you know, I mentioned Netflix, um, you know, Netflix has, you know, basically two prices. So their issue there for a Netflix is not complexity in the individual contract. It's actually in the number of subscribers. However, in the B2B world, to remain competitive, typically a contract is individually negotiated. So that price is not standard and repeated across different customers. It's actually uh, germane to that individual uh, negotiation and needs to be supported as part of the system. We're also seeing much more combination and bundling. Um, think of, you know, think of um, when you buy a car, many car companies are now offering um, something like an OnStar service, which is subscription-based. So even though the car itself is a one-time sale, there are a number of services and products associated with that one-time sale, which are on a subscription basis and, and need to be thought of as an entirety. And the final driver uh, I've identified here is that through uh, mergers and acquisitions, many larger organizations find that they have multiple billing systems and multiple monetization platforms. And maybe this is an opportunity to, with an eye on the future, think about how they can rationalize these into one system. Next slide, please. So um, notwithstanding the, some of the drivers, um, we also have some ideas about how companies are, if you like, putting their toe in the water. Uh, one way that they're doing this is to look at, um, you know, am I going to introduce new products? I mentioned, you know, the OnStar style service. Well, that's, that's a new product. It's an associated with an existing product, in that instance, a car. But there are many other aspects or many other opportunities for organizations to think, how can we add to our existing one-time sale model with, a, with associated subscription base? Um, so that's the bundle idea. We've also seen companies who are testing the waters by looking at a particular region or geography um, and switching the pricing model or the, the business model to a subscription model and testing that to see how that works. Um, because one of the aspects of subscription, which perhaps is, is not as well known, is there, um, there are many different variations. It, isn't just, it doesn't just have to be a flat fee. It could also be a usage based. So one of the things to think about is for my business, for my products and services, for my customers, maybe the right solution is a mixture of one time fat free subscription, but also usage where what you pay is determined by what's consumed. And finally, um, the, the, the other part to this is that the pricing models describe how you do business, but it doesn't actually describe how you compute the price. And as you delve more into this, you'll understand that there are many different ways of actually deriving that price, especially around usage, where the price itself is only evaluated at the end of a period or on an ongoing basis, dependent upon how much is being used by your customer. And that formula can be based around tiers, where as you hit certain different volumes, different discounts kick in. And there's also what's known as attribute pricing where dependent on who's buying what, where, and when, the price can vary. You can have custom formulas, as I said, time event and demand base. So there are very different ways of actually computing that price. So it's not just, I have a subscription model. It's within that subscription model, 
what's the best and most appropriate for my industry with my products and services and my buyers. Next slide. Um, and the final little section here is I just want to talk about, um, you know, the, the entry point here is, you know, things you need to know. So, you know, one of the, and again, this is something I've observed throughout my career is, and I always talk about it to people who are part of my group, is that um, for many customers, these type of transformational projects are both an opportunity, but are also can be a little scary. Uh, we've all heard of projects which go wrong and, you know, a, a work, you know, at best the company loses money, at worst you lose your job. So there is a degree of hesitation, I'm sure, within people about, I don't want to take on a science project. So some of the things to think about are is, you know, how do, how do, I, how do I ensure that I'm risk-proofing my future? Um, and one of the ways to do that is to understand some of the things that might not be um, necessary today, but will be necessary tomorrow. And one of, the, one of the key things here is that customers want one invoice. Um, you don't want to be introducing new products and services which result in the customer having to receive multiple invoices um, dependent on which products or customer or services you're actually billing for. That's a key one. Uh, if that's the case, then you need to be able to integrate with your existing invoicing systems. You know, most larger companies who are looking at moving into the subscription market already have these type of systems. So integration is key. Uh, another key aspect is, is ensuring that if you have customer and product masters, these are fully integrated so that all addresses are similar, dependent regardless of which product or services you're consuming. You want a single collection and dunning process. So again, there's not multiple touch points with your customer, depending on which product or service they're looking at. Uh, that leads to accounts receivable integration. Uh, through throughput processing is this idea that you want to minimize the need for human intervention in the process. You know, we're all conscious of customer experience. Uh, for many subscription products, the only touch point is the billing process. And one thing you don't want to do is, is either be presenting your customer with wrong bills or as importantly, if they make a change, that resulting in a lot of manual reconfiguration and readjustments, that should all happen automatically. Likewise, proration, if you, if you adjust what you're buying mid-cycle, mid then the system needs to automatically ensure that that price is adjusted um, proration, prorated based where you are <laughs> in the period. And the final point is, before I, I switch over, is cultural change. Um, for those companies who traditionally have been involved with selling, one-time selling, there is a degree of cultural change with subscription. And this is not a technology issue. This is a, not necessarily a process issue. This is how people think about their business and should not be underestimated and should be incorporated in ensuring that if you do make the switch, that you're putting yourself in the best position to succeed. Next slide. So at this point, uh, I think we want to do a poll. So if I can turn it back to- Ooh, absolutely. We have a poll for everybody. And if you just want to um, answer the question, um, as you can see it on your screen right now, where are you in your recurring revenue transformation? Are you just getting started? Maybe one to two years in, you are up and running and you are mature in your, with your solution, or maybe you haven't even started yet. So I'll keep this poll going for just a little bit longer. And Dennis and Steven, I believe you can see the results as well on uh, as a panelist. And we've got, I'm just going to end the poll now so we can see it with uh, the people that have answered. And you can see that right here. 30%, 36% just getting started, 18% one to two years in, and 45% up and running with a mature solution. And our attendees here today, they have are up and running. Nobody is just getting started. <laughs> Interesting data. I uh, you know, from 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 my perspective, it's great to see. Um, I think, you know, certainly as a what what we have seen uh, in, in our journey with many of our customers is companies that have 
implemented solutions around uh, subscription management, for example. Um, but as those, uh, as the processes and the relationship with the customer continue to evolve, um, they then sort of run into the downstream challenge with challenges like, um, to your point earlier, Stephen, you know, I'm up, I'm up and running with, uh, up and running with with subscription management, but now you know my customers are asking me about usage and they're asking me about tiering and they're asking me about you know how do I integrate both you know physical and digital uh, onto a single invoice and you know how do I how do I take that next step? Yeah, um, and certainly um, you know I, I you know I'm I'm looking at market fo market forces that are that are happening driven by customers and you're right you know usage is becoming much more of an importance to a customer um, you know if i can characterize it like you know we, we we've trained the sales organizations to maximize revenue up front um, whereas from a customer point of view that actually is not necessarily the right model what they really want to do is to build into a solution and as it becomes more adopted within their organization, then they're willing to expand usage. So, um, you know, that's very much switching to a usage based as opposed to a proceed or a let's, let's sell as much up front. So I think, you know, even though perhaps you have adopted a, a, a billing subscription solution now, um, the market itself is going to force you to rethink perhaps the way you're doing it from today. So Dennis, I think, um, yeah. We'll and the microphone over to you. Great. Um, well, thanks, Kathy, and thanks, Stephen. And um, you know, Stephen, you made a point at the end there, is uh, uh, you know, talking about even even compensation models changing. And uh, I, I think that's a that's really kind of an insightful point, which is which speaks to the fact that this is a culture shift, right? So it's not simply about you know, enabling customers to to have a recurring re revenue relationship with the with the vendor, um, but really understanding what the downstream implications are. And I'm sure we'll talk about you know cultural things uh, later. But uh, I just thought that was a really interesting tie-in because it it does affect operations, it affects sales, it affects marketing. I mean, uh, literally the the entire organization has to kind of uh, do some level of transformation around it. But um, <clears throat> anyway. Um, uh, I don't think we'd be doing this webinar if we were in in violent disagreement, uh, Stephen. On most of these most of these elements, though, uh, I think it might make for an interesting uh, might make for an interesting webinar. But <laughs> um, your your research and findings are a direct reflection of of what we see uh, from our customers. And you know, interestingly, you know, it's not uh, limited to any particular industry. Um, you know, you take a look at uh, just a, a subset of our customers at, at the enterprise scale, a uh, company like Xander, it's a, uh, you know, $1.6 billion uh, subsidiary of AT&T that does digital, advertise, digital advertising or they're a digital media brokerage or a company like PGI, which has really complex uh, telco-like kinds of models, leveraging subscription and usage and bundling and high volume and, and high complexity or software companies like SolarWinds, um, where they have grown both through, you know, uh, uh, very accelerated organic growth along with uh, a, a bunch of M&A. Um, so multiple revenue models and, and a, but, but a customer focus where they like to experiment with new approaches to align their value to the customer's perception and the idea that in you know very short order they can you know design and launch a new type of billing model and distribute it to their customers um, you know it seems all of our customers uh, in one way or another are leveraging revenue operations as a competitive differentiator um, as well as a vehicle to um, improve the overall customer experience by really making it a frictionless one. Steven, I think you might have gone on mute or did I? Thank you. That's the that's the phrase <laughs> of 20, 
2020-2021. I apologize for that. Yeah, so um, so um, I think this this is one of the one of the key themes of what we're talking about today. And obviously, from a from a from a research point of view and from an analyst point of view, um, one of the aspects of this transformation that I'm very conscious of is the um, the the temptation is to um, as one gets started or as one uh, is thinking about uh, moving to the subscription model that the that there is this nice shiny object in the corner which looks like it's going to easily um, support what I'm trying to do today and that may be the case uh, one of the themes of this is and as Dennis says is that our observation is that most organizations go through a journey. It's a transformation journey. And what might support your business model today is not necessarily going to support it tomorrow. And one of the key things I think Dennis referenced was that this idea of switching from a flat fee subscription to a usage. Uh, likewise, the need to integrate with um, other parts of the organization. Um, or integrate or build in more more billing. And I think as, as the organization goes through this transformation and the shift between the one-time selling to the subscription moves towards more heavily the subscription and usage side, you'll often find that the shiny object is not going to be supporting you in the future. And I think it's important that um, whatever decisions you make today are going to support that natural transformation. You know, we've seen it with the pandemic. I mean, nobody would have, nobody would have thought three, four years ago, the acceleration and transformation that's happened over the past 18 months. It's not that it, it's not that the pandemic changed things. It didn't change things, but it accelerated. <clears throat> And I think um, one can sort of squint and think of other situations like this. So it's important from, from my point of view as an analyst to caution people to make sure that they're, they're adopting both processes and technology, which are going to support them not just for today, but for tomorrow and the day after. Dennis. Yeah, um, and, and I think what, what, what I think is interesting is, you know, we, uh, Steve, and you referenced Netflix earlier, and and you know there are a number of companies that are you know m more recent that have, uh, I guess that that were were born in the last decade per se, <laughs> if if you will, um, or or 15 years where, that have you know came into the market with this concept of of leveraging these types of recurring revenue relationship models, but. It's not just those companies that are that are making big changes and transforming you know, how they manage the customer relationship. <clears throat> I mean, it's traditional legacy companies that have been around for decades and, you know, trying to make that transition from selling a tangible good into turning that into um, a value add service or, or being able to blend the, those two things together. Um, you know, some some good examples that come to mind for me, you know, you've got a company like car manufacturers in general, but, you know, companies like Volkswagen that are, they're, they're expanding uh, from, you know, the um, traditional indirect sales model of selling cars through dealerships into electronic, electronic, uh, electric, <laughs> electric vehicle sharing, where, you know, you don't have to own a car anymore. You just need to be able to have access to transportation. And if you can walk out of your house and open an app on your phone and say, or walk out of your apartment in the city and open an app on your phone and say, where's the nearest car? Oh, it's right down the block. And I can, I can hit a button and it basically opens, a, opens that car and the meter starts turning as I be able to use that car. And, to, and then as soon as I finish that ride, wherever I'm going, I can, I can, I, I hit the button on my phone and it, and it generates an invoice for me. Um, or, or companies like um, uh, Valmont Industries. So um, Valmont is a 75 year old agricultural and infrastructure equipment manufacturer. Like, you know, when 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 you when you when you hear the description of the company, you 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 don't think uh, you know digital transformation. You think you know sprinklers and uh, and and power poles and um, you know these guys have 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 really transformed the way they are monetizing the customer relationship and and turning these you know large pieces of equipment into. Uh, 
you know, yes, people can still purchase them uh, as they had historically, but now they're wrapping these things with services, whether they're value add services or the ability to, um, you know, pay to your point earlier for, you know, usage of that piece of equipment versus the piece of equipment itself. Um, and I think it's really just interesting how they, how, how, how these, how these legacy companies, traditional uh, you know, brick and mortar companies are are really changing the transforming the way they manage the relationship with their with their customer. So building on that, um, you know, that's sort of the business model side of things. And I think it's, you know, I think it's important. I, I have this adage that if your business model is controlled by your technology, you have the wrong technology. So, you know, to compete in today's model you know, business world, you know, you really do need to have the flexibility and agility to be able to adapt your business model to, to what the market and the customers are looking for. But that also imposes some uh, uh, burden on your underlying systems. And I, you know, and we've talked about this and, and Dennis is right to reference that if you're a digitally native company, i.e. you've always had subscription-based business, uh, your issues are different than if you're a legacy company. If you're a legacy company, you already have an ERP system. You already have an invoicing system. You already have AR systems. You already have collection systems. So, um, you know, in, in today's world where customer experience, you know, you can't turn around without reading yet another article about customer experience and the, and the, and the real value of delivering a good customer experience. Well, part of that customer experience is the, that of the whole monetization process should be seamless. And I'm actually writing a paper at the moment and I was trying to come up, what is, should I, should I use the word joins? What, what, what am I trying to say here? And I actually came up with seamless because under the covers, there may be a number of different scenes where systems are joining together, that your subscription billing system is actually joining with your one-time system, if that's the way you want to go. Um, but that join should be seamless. So it, it's very important that the underlying platform and technology that you're using is ensuring that there is this seamless experience from the customer point of view. And I did, I did touch upon this, you know, if I change my, if I change what my order looks like, or what my contract looks like, that contract may be a mixture of one-time subscription and usage-based systems. But whatever happens under the covers should not be part of the customer experience. It should be seamless. To the customer experience, and this is a this is a very important point, and I think something that again, that shiny object in the corner may look very attractive today, but uh, I can assure you that as your organization goes through this transformation, the last thing you want to do is to be imposing upon the customer, letting them see the scenes, making them responsible for your scenes. That's not the way to go. It should be a seamless customer experience, and it's important that the platform supporting this subscription management and this billing monetization understands that and can deal with it. Dennis, your thoughts on that? Sorry, now I'm the one that's muted. Um, <laughs> Stephen, uh, you know, we did a, we did a, uh, at the end of, of last year, um, did a little bit of our own uh, research around uh, trends in finance and, uh, you know, I, I don't I don't remember the exact numbers, but I don't think I'm too far off. But like the average Fortune 2000 company has, on average, something like five or or seven billing systems. So as enterprises start to move to these new types of of operating and revenue models, what are you going to do? Add more systems? You know, I think I think the only way you can meaningfully advance your business strategy to your point is to have a, a flexible, scalable, extensible platform. Certainly that's a bit of a self-serving comment, but I, I think it's true nonetheless, but that are gonna that are gonna support evolving quote to cash processes and enable you to support really any kind of 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 business or revenue model. Um, you know it it's it's far it, it's far too frequent in, in recent years as 
companies are, you know, starting to, to, to dip their toe in the water or have even been, you know, uh, uh, experimenting with different types of, 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 of revenue models that they evolve and, and they don't necessarily always evolve in the way that you anticipated. <laughs> um, you know, you can do a lot of planning and, uh, and you can, you can try to see the future, but inevitably your, your customer is going to, is going to knock you a bit off your, your original, your original path. And you're going to need to, um, I guess maybe pivot a, a bit to be able to, to support the customer demand and to be able to support, um, you know, the, the competitive in uh, the, the competitive factors that come into play as well when you know your biggest competitor introduces a, a, a different type of 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 uh, engagement model with with the customer so you know as a company that's focused specifically on these types of challenges meaning building platform i i think we're we feel we are uniquely capable to solve this problem versus, you know, some of the very, very large enterprise software companies that do a lot of things pretty well. Uh, and, to, and to that point, Dennis, I think, again, part of this theme is, you know, I, you know, I kept it here, you don't know what you don't know, which is, which is not to be rude or arrogant, <clears throat> but it's basically saying that things are changing so quickly, your customers are changing so quickly, competitive pressures, new entrants into the market, that it's, it's though you cannot, you know, we cannot predict the future. What we can do is put ourselves in place that as the future comes, we're in a position to deal with it. And, you know, I, I'll, I, I remember conversations about, you know, scale, you know, as you grow your, your, your non one time sales business, the immediate thought of scale is, oh, well, we, we're going to have more transactions, we need more horsepower. Well, scale isn't just transactions. Scale also can be the number of products and bundles you're dealing with. Scale can be the variety of pricing you have to deal with. A scale can be a number of things and your ability to quickly respond, introduce new product lines, have them integrated within the overall customer experience is going to be crucial for you both to remain competitive, but also to ensure that you are maintaining that smooth, seamless customer experience. So again, the right platform is not just what can satisfy your needs today but has the agility and the capability and the, dare I say it, scalability to ensure that whatever comes down the pike, um, you're gonna be in a position to be able to adapt quickly and seamlessly to ensure that you're both remaining competitive to new entrances, but also to provide that customer experience, which ensures that your customers keep coming back for more and more. Dennis, do you have any comments on that? I'm sure you don't. <laughs> No, uh, it is, I, you know what? Where I immediately, what, where I immediately go is, is I think about, you know, different customers and and how they've, how they've, how we've grown with them and they've grown with us. Uh, you know, I, I, we have a a company. It's a it's a billion dollar plus company in the uh, in the insurance space, and you know for for the, and and they've they've had you know very positive growth through through the history of the company uh, and while they did invest you know significant sums of money in in a in a ERP system you know 15 years ago even then that system was never really able to support the complexity of their billing models so they did it pretty much all manually with excel spreadsheets and people um and as they started to incorporate recurring revenue models into their already existing relatively complex business um you know it, it it could no longer be supported by people and and spreadsheets and so by in, investing in a solution like billing platform and 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 you know i obviously i'm 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 a bit biased but there's other companies out there that do things that are similar in nature to what we do but now they can they can consolidate all of this data that was was running through you know multiple multiple spreadsheets onto a single platform for reporting and analytics they've been able to automate processes which eliminate leakage and human error and 
you know, n- not only are they prepared for whatever the the next big thing is as their business continues to grow and scale and 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 evolve but like they can proactively experiment with new models and and not be forced to wait the 3 to 6 months for their their systems to be able to accommodate these changes and, and you know i've talked about a couple of large companies but on the other extreme, you have, you know, we, we have an early stage company, um, uh, a company called Sidon, which is, you know, very, very early stage, um, early stage in revenue, but they're in the communications industry and they know the complexity of their business and the, and the billing models and, and revenue models that they're, that they're envisioning are going to scale exponentially. So they're, they're thinking about that today and planning for the future and investing in the right systems that are going to support that growth. So I guess my point is, you know, regardless of whether you're a very, very big company or, or you're a, you know, a relatively small one, the, the last thing that you want is, you know, your systems to constrain your ability to drive an amazing customer experience. Yeah, I totally agree. Again, you know, if your if your business processes and models are being constrained by your technology, you have the wrong technology. So I I hear people talking yeah. about this from all stages of, of business. We have another poll for everybody. And if you I'm gonna launch it right now. So here's the question. How do you handle billing today? Are you in a legacy system? Do you use multiple systems? Do you have ERP, CRM, manage it that way? You've got a shiny object that you are excited about or you just don't know. So if you can uh, just uh, enter your answer here, we've got a few people entering here and if we'll wait for you to put in your answer. And uh, I'm not going to divulge the answer just yet, but I am not surprised that there is one that's leading the pack here, Stephen and Dennis. I'm sure you see this all the time. Okay, uh, waiting for a couple more answers. Okay, well, I'm going to close the uh, poll now. And we have, out of all these choices, 75% have multiple systems. Is that unusual for you, Stephen? Dennis? No, no, I mean, I think, I think this is, you know, for, for larger companies, especially if they're, you know, if they're formed through acquisitions or mergers, the, you know, billing was never thought of as being anything but a, a, a necessary evil. And I think, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's today's market and certainly with subscription world, whereas I mentioned earlier, you know, often the only touch point you'll have with a customer is that bill presentment or that uh, order adjustment process. Um, so, you know, going from a back office necessary evil to a crucial part of your customer experience means that I think, you know, what was okay yesterday is no longer okay today. And I think this is why we're seeing a lot more interest from, as, as Dennis described them, legacy companies who are reevaluating not just how they do business, but what systems they have in place to support how they do business. Dennis. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I have competing thoughts here and I'm uh, trying to figure out which one to start with, but. Um, uh, you know, this multiple systems is, is a big driver. And, you know, what it comes down to is when you, when you, you, you think of all the redundancy that is created when you've got, you know, five different billing systems within an organization, when you know that you're either going to need to send out multiple invoices to a customer in order to kind of account for all the different parts of their relationship with the, with the enterprise, you know, or, you have to invest in yet another system to consolidate all of the invoicing and and, and distribute invoices that way. Um, you know the it, and then and then you you kind of layer on top of that. You know, billing data is obviously extremely valuable, and 
helps you, it gains, gives you insight into all manner of the, the all, all elements of the customer relationship. So if, <clears throat> if you can start at a point where you can consolidate that onto a single platform and be able to leverage that to, to you know, Im- improve how you, how you drive margins on your product as, as, a, as a vendor, how you, how you can Im- improve on the margins on your product, for example, um, you know, where you see trends with, with your customer, understanding um, you know, tendencies um, and, and trends within the customer relationship that could be indicators of you know, new business opportunity, uh, potential of, of churn or loss of customer. Um, you know, when you can look at that in, in, uh, at, a, at a macro level, um, the, the, the information that you can get from that is extremely valuable and, and I think in many enterprises underutilized. You know, that's, a, that's a very good point, Dennis. That, you know, it, it's something that I didn't really touch on, but, it's, but it is, you know, I was, you know, you know, my research has shown that, that, that you know, this is where domains blur into each other. You know, typically billing was a back office, you know, cash collection, finance function. No, it, it no longer is. It's actually part of that customer experience. And, it's, and, it's, and you're right, it's not just, the experience of the consumer on the other side of the fence, but it's also an organization's ability to sift through the information and make that experience better, better in terms of the customer, but better also for the vendor in terms of, do I really understand how my customer reacts? How they, you know, what, what, what are the stimuli that are going to make them a better customer for me and also my ability to support them as a vendor and as a partner. And I think, you know, I, the, the, again, this is something that I'm increasingly um, I'm thinking and writing about is that, you know, the whole, the whole cultural shift is it's, it's moving much more from a vendor buyer to a partner. So the more one can understand about your partner, i.e. your customer, from utilizing the data, the better that relationship is going to be. And, you know, again, the information that you're discussing is crucial. It, it's not the only information, but it's certainly a very important part of understanding that relationship. So I think I have um, uh, a slide here where I'm just summarizing some of the, some of the key points that have come out of our discussion uh, with Dennis and, you know, again, uh, ad hoc spreadsheets. We all, you know, I've, I, I'm as guilty as the next person. Oh, I can do this in a spreadsheet. Well, that's fine until you can't. And I think what we're pointing out here is that inevitably, as you mature and as you travel along the trans- digital transformation and the subscription model, you'll find very quickly that, that that ad hoc spreadsheet support doesn't scale. And as importantly, it's not reusable. So anything you've actually learned or built, you have to throw away which is why a solid platform is a much better solution. Because even if you're not using, you know, 50% of all the bells and whistles today, you can reuse whatever you've learned to take advantage of those bells and whistles looking to the future. Um, And as companies grow more comfortably, you know, this ability to not knowing the future, you know, we can't forecast the future. We can't foretell the future, I should say. But we can put ourselves in a position that when the future arrives, we're in, a, we're in a position to be able to react, whether that's new products, new pricing, uh, new bundles, um, to either stave off competition or to enter new markets. Next slide. So, you know, I've, I've characterized this as think big, start small and scale fast. So key thing here is know, know where you're going. Um, have, have, a, have a vision for where you're going. You don't have to work all the details. But, you know, to avoid this trap of solving today's problems and putting yourself in a box canyon for tomorrow, uh, have an idea where you want to go so that when you start small and learn what works, you can reuse those learnings in the right platform to actually expand um, as as your organization goes through the transformation. Um, Can't underestimate the importance of the change in internal culture. You know, one of, one of my statements is that technology is not, is not the transformation. 
the transformation is the transformation. The technology supports the transformation, but you need that, that leadership and that process change and that cultural change to fully embrace the subscription model. And, you know, again, start with an application that will grow with you, um, can be reused, is not just solving today's. And, you know, the, the, the final point, I think Dennis raised this, uh, if you do have existing billing systems, or many, and it sounds like uh, many of the audience here today do, you know, this is an opportunity to, to rethink that whole, that whole move it away from the back office, much more into the, into the whole customer experience and provide that crucial good customer experience, which is going to show repeat customers for you and your organization. Dennis, your, your takeaways. You're muted again. Dennis. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, I, uh, I, I think you did a great job of, of, uh, really summarizing the, the key points here. Um, I will, I, I will take 30 seconds and, and, you know, give, give a little bit of, uh, of a, uh, uh, of, of the of the sales pitch around billing platform and and what brought us here today, um, you know I'm I could probably be accused of of some level of bias uh, with respect to telling you how great billing platform is and how it can solve all of the problems that Stephen and I just talked about, um, but I, I guess I'll say don't just take my word for it. Um, you know we've been working with a number of analysts, including Ventana, um, in kind of validating. Um, vetting and uh, and and demonstrating uh, to the market, you know how we solve customers' problems and have earned a a meaningful amount of recognition for it. But you know, I, I think I think it's not only uh, important that you have the, the the feedback and the recognition from third parties, but you also have the feedback and the recognition from your own customers who we have been very fortunate enough to, to earn the business of, of a number of great enterprises across a number of industries. Um, Mary, you can change it. <clears throat> or June. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I think that our vision has always been uh, with an eye towards, you know, not how do you manage subscriptions, but how do you manage, uh, how do you how do you drive a an, an amazing customer experience, and how do you give the oppor give the enterprise an opportunity to 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 scale um, and and to accelerate their growth? And uh, you know we've been as I've said we've been very fortunate enough to earn customers uh, you know both at the both at the commercial mid-market size, as well as at the enterprise scale, um, where we've been able to demonstrate that ability to execute. Well, thank you. I'd like to invite everybody. We are going to be opening up Q&A, so please start putting your questions in the chat and Q for your questions and answers uh, now. But I do have one last poll for you. And the question is, why did you come to this webinar? Just a little bit of um, understanding for us. Do you have broken systems? Are you evaluating any new billing models? Do you have some broken processes um, in your operations you need to understand? Are you moving into new types of markets? Do you have or feel competitive pressure? And or is your CEO wanting you to really understand all of this? So quick question there. And for those of you who have answered, I'm seeing an overwhelming um, answer here. Um, so give a few more seconds and then we are gonna go uh, get the reaction from uh, Stephen and Dennis and go right into our Q&A. So I'm gonna end the poll. Uh, now with the uh, answers that we have, 60% uh, of you are evaluating new and emerging models. Uh, the remainder are split evenly between broken systems and competitive pressure. So very, very interesting uh, results. Uh, Dennis and Stephen, your thoughts? I'll just say I'm glad that uh, uh... I'm glad that the, that the CEO isn't just forcing you to be here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. good, good, good. Um, 
Anything uh, for you? Hey, Steven, Steve? you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think we've identified that, um, you know, for many organizations for whom billing was not, uh, was not seen as a vital, a vital part of their business. I think, you know, the last number of years has, has, has turned that around its head. So I'm not surprised that there are more organizations now looking at how can we, how can we improve the customer experience? Experience. What do we need to put in place now to ensure that you know that we are going to be a business um, succeeding in the future? So I think this is this is well in line what I'm seeing in the marketplace. Kathy, interesting, interesting. Um, I think Mary, um, did you want to move to the next slide? I think we're so. With that, um, if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. I do have one here. Um, Stephen or Dennis, you can uh, raise your hand who wants to take this first. Uh, most CRM and ERP vendors claim to provide competitive quote to cash process uh, to support billing, invoicing, and revenue management. What trade offs are made if we decide to go with one of these uh, portfolio providers uh, for complete quote to cash support? It's a long question. Hopefully, you got it. Um, Stephen, I'll take it first. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make the answer answer short, but um, you know, I, I think as you start to look at those large, you know, sort of portfolio vendors, if you will, um, I, I think the difference is, you know, you, you certainly can think about one throat to choke, right? Um, but the other side of that is, most of those companies came from from either CRM or from ERP. And they've made their they've they've worked their way back into sort of I'll call it the middle where the quote to cash processes sit, um, but they didn't come into the market with the idea of tackling that particular business problem and business challenge. So oftentimes I think that the 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 modules or elements that um, the modules or elements that that are kind of sitting in the quote to cash space for these large portfolio vendors. Um, you know, often wind up being, um, to, to use a cliche, the, the, the redheaded stepchildren that, you know, don't necessarily get the, the attention that their, their core products uh, will, will receive. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, one, one is with an apocryphal story that I remember talking to a, a very high exec in one of the ERP companies and we're discussing billing and he dismissed it with a wave of his hand and said, oh, that's just a finance thing, um, which I think encapsulates that he didn't quite understand the transformation that's happened and, and why quote to cash now is more than just a financial transaction. It's actually part and parcel of the customer experience. The second point I'd point out is that uh, an ERP and we're really talking about ARAP and um, uh, the, the, the GL, um, they're not designed for innovation and agility. They're designed to be the system of record for your financial transactions. What we're talking about here is part and parcel of how you go to business. Um, I would never run my business on a general ledger. Why would I run my subscription management system on, a, on an ERP system? I wouldn't. I'd be looking to that nimble, agile platform, which is going to be, allow me to adapt as circumstances dictate. Uh, nobody ever said to me a GL is an innovative agile platform it isn't my good answer there um i love the whole concept of shiny objects so when you reference shiny objects as an option for subscription billing what issues might we be running into as we grow in complexity as a business what do we need to keep up in mind for for future proofing Dennis, I'm going to let you answer this one first. I have to think of a, of a polite way of answering it. You don't have to. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> it it is all uh, it is all too often that we run into a uh, a company that um, you know, I, I'm I'm going to say thought was thinking short term um, that 
saw that their competitors were introducing, you know, some new revenue models like subscriptions and said, we have to do that subscription thing. Um, and, um, you know, whether it was, whether it was, was the vendor just doing a great sales job or the enterprise, maybe not thinking as long term, but, you know, the, I, when it, when it comes to billing and it comes to revenue operations, like that's a systemic part of your, your company. And you need to think about those solution systems processes uh, with, with a bit more of a long-term view. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's too many times that, you know, we, we come into a space where uh, a customer invested into a billing system that, that, that looked great, but really didn't do all of the analysis required to understand is this really have kind of the flexibility to support um, what is kind of next on the docket for our revenue operations capabilities. Yes, you were you weren't quite as polite as I thought. I mean, you were more polite than I thought you were going to be, Dennis. Um, so <laughs> let me put it this way: there are a lot of sorry, there are products on the market for whom you know we talked about this digitally native. So there are products that that themselves grew up as digitally native products in a digitally native world, and which is not to say that they're bad products. They're not bad products at all, but their DNA is for organizations that out of the blocks were subscription based and they don't really understand and therefore cannot support some of the challenges that a legacy company has combining both the one time and the subscription usage based systems and understanding this whole back off seamless integration capability which is necessary for ensuring that unified view from the customer point of view and to, you know, as Dennis rightly pointed out, with a view to providing the right inf combined data information to enable more than just the billing function, but to view it as more of a revenue function, which allows me to have a better insights and better understanding as to my customers. Uh, that's, you know, that's certainly what I'd say, you know, the more grown up platforms who grew up in this multi uh, hybrid world, um, they better understand that than some of the, the other products. Out. Mm -hmm. Good information. Um, we are running to the top of the hour here. I'm gonna ask Stephen and, and Dennis one last question. What is your final bit of advice for everyone? I'll go first. Um, my, my, my advice is, is, you know, we've seen over the past 18 months, nobody could have foreseen the pandemic. Or those of them who did see, foresee it were voices in the, you know, crying in the wind and the rest of us paid no attention. But I think the lesson learned from it is that, you know, we're in an accelerating world. Things are happening faster, quicker, the global, you know, what happens in China can impact us today much more than it did 20, 30 years ago. Um, so you need to be ready for whatever's going to come down the pike. And, you know, whenever you're thinking about systems like we've been discussing today, you know, a good system is not just solving today's, to today's issues, but it's putting you in a position that you can tackle tomorrow's with confidence. That's that's my big takeaway. Great advice, Dennis. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it really short. Um, I, I won't just say talk to billing platform, um, <laughs> but uh, what what I will say is, you know, uh, I I think it's when you're making an investment in a billing system, it's not a it's not going to be a six month relationship. So, um, you know, I, I recommend doing doing your homework, making sure that you are investing into something that will able to support your business, you know, not just for today, but into the future. I think that's very sage advice. Absolutely. So I want to thank everybody for attending today. 
all of you and for those of you watching on demand, we're going to be sending you a link to what's on your screen today, which is new research by Ventana on enabling advanced monetization. So I'd encourage everybody to go to the link on your screen. You'll be getting an email uh, from us and from, uh, from the team at Billing Platform to make sure you have access to this for your research and understanding. So with that, thank you all today. Dennis and Stephen, thank you. Great, great information. Mm -hmm.